I'm Luke Story. For the past 22 years, I've been relentlessly committed to my deepest passion, designing the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of spirituality, health, psychology, and personal development. The Lifestylist Podcast is a show dedicated to sharing my discoveries and the experts behind them with you. The episode you're listening to would not be possible without the support from our friends over at surthrival.com. And I've got an amazing new product called Taboo to tell you about right now. This is a super sexy supplement made from all natural ingredients. Now, it was originally developed for women, but as a man, I got to tell you, it absolutely works. You know what it does? It's crazy. It causes erectile tissue to engorge with blood, kind of like that little blue pharmaceutical pill, but without the harsh side effects. And it tastes delicious because it's got rich chocolate, vanilla, and even a touch of maple syrup to stimulate the senses. What really makes the magic happen, though, is the nutraceutical-grade extracts of ashwagandha, horny goat weed, tribulus, maca, muira puama, and velvet antler, which is known for balancing hormones and for sexual health and libido enhancement. So here's what you do. You take an extra dose about 20 to 30 minutes before hitting the sheets, and it is known to enhance orgasm and release sexual anxiety. This is a super potent, all-natural formula. The great thing about Taboo, though, is that it's completely safe. It doesn't contain some of those dangerous herbs like Yohimbi, often seen in other sexual formulas. And in fact, many formulas on the market are not safe to take regularly and can cause increased heart rate and other ill side effects. And I know that to be true because once I overdosed on Yohimbi and it was not pleasant at all, I swear to God. So Taboo works best taken daily as an adaptogen and hormone balancer and really helps with low libido and hormonal issues. It also works in the short term, just on demand to enhance sexual performance, pleasure, and desire. So this is a powerful and natural aphrodisiac for men and women, and you can find it over at surthrival.com. Again, it's called Taboo, and the website is surthrival.com. That's S-U-R-T-H-R-I-V-A-L, surthrival.com. But wait, it gets better. You can get your groove on with a little discount code. The code is STYLE10, and that's good through October 2020 at surthrival.com. Check it out. I want you to use your imagination for a moment. Take a second and just imagine a probiotic that actually works, one that actually does what it's supposed to do, heal your gut. When you find the right probiotic, the one that works, it's like winning the gut lottery. That's where our friends at Just Thrive Probiotic come in. Just Thrive Probiotic is the first and only 100% all-natural spore form, DNA verified and tested probiotic supplement. That means it has 100% survivability. It makes it through your digestive tract and does its magic in there because it doesn't get killed on the way down. It's got clinically proven strains for leaky gut, They're doing nine other ongoing human clinical trials. This is a really powerful way to support your immune system and your brain. Now, your brain really depends on the health of your gut. So not only does having a jacked up gut suck because you get all bloated and gassy and the leaky gut issues and all that, but your brain really depends on the health of your gut. And our friends over at Just Thrive have nailed it when it comes to a product that really works. You take one capsule per day with meal and you're done. You're going to heal that gut. You're going to improve your digestion. And this is how I've recently really helped my digestion and my gut health overall because I've always had problems with that. And it's getting better and better the longer I use the Just Thrive probiotic. It has completely changed the game for me. And I wanted to change the game for you. So if you want to make that happen, it's super easy. Just get over to thriveprobiotic.com forward slash Luke. That's thriveprobiotic.com forward slash Luke. And when you use the code Luke15 over there, you're going to save 15% off your order. That's Luke15 at thriveprobiotic.com forward slash Luke. Welcome to episode 298 of the Lifestylist Podcast. We're going to be talking about EMS today. And these are questions that were taken from the Lifestylist Podcast Facebook group. But before we jump into that, let's get into next week's episode coming out on Tuesday. It's called Shot in the Dark. Blowing the Whistle on the Vaccine Industry and COVID with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And that is an episode that I'm really excited to share, uh, however apprehensive that it might just get me deplatformed and kicked off the internet because I dare ask questions of Big Pharma and Big Brother. 
Anywho, it's going to be a great show. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss uh, next week's episode or any episode to follow. Now, before I get into this, I would like to say that this podcast does not offer legal or medical advice. You should definitely seek the counsel of licensed professionals before making any dramatic lifestyle changes. I am absolutely not making any medical claims or recommendations personal to you, just sharing my experience. And I'm a student as much as a teacher, and I'm always learning more and refining my approach to healthy living. And as I continue to learn more, I share what I find along the way. So there's our little legal disclaimer. Don't try to sue my ass if you you know, get all the EMF out of your life and don't feel better. No, I'm just kidding. Um, all of the items discussed in this episode are linked in the show notes at lukestory.com. And many of the products that I talk about on the podcast in general, and especially the solo shows, can be found where I keep a collection of all of my favorite things over at lukestory.com slash store. You're also going to find some exclusive discounts over there. So if you're listening to the show and you're like, wait, what was that thing? Where do I get that? I want that. Don't trip. I got you, boo. It's at lukestory.com slash store. Now, today's solo episode will focus on questions submitted to the Lifestylist Podcast Facebook group. And of course, I encourage you to get over there and join. And EMF is one of the top topics of concern in that group and is by far the most frequent topic about which I've received questions through my website contact form and various social media channels. EMF is like the hot topic, has been ever since I started this podcast four plus years ago. I think because it's the most confusing to people and it's really just hard to figure out on your own. So I'm going to do my best to uh, create some clarity here. And my passion about EMF really started about two decades ago due to being really sensitive to them. Uh, When I'm around an EMF environment, I just don't feel good. And so my interest in sharing this information was born out of three years of radiation sickness caused by living directly under two cell towers in my uh, last LA apartment. Now, despite my many years of deep commitment to health and nutrition, my life became almost unbearable during this period due to the extremely high EMF levels in my home. And I didn't know that that's what was making me sick uh, until one day I fatefully discovered these um, (laughs) gnarly towers across the street and I promptly moved. Um, And I honestly believe that EMF and non-native blue light that I'm going to talk a little bit about here today too, uh, the exposure to those is as toxic and damaging as a junk food diet. That's, that's me. That's, I truly believe that, um, based on my own experience and just all the research I've done and all the experts that I've interviewed. So as far as like lifestyle goes, uh, I'm going to say get regular exercise. I think that's really good for you. Whatever exercise you can do without damaging your joints, et cetera. Uh, and if you're following the diet right here that I'm going to recommend, you're already winning the food game. Okay. That means your diet excludes GMOs, pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides, especially Roundup, MSG, monosodium glutamate, which is hidden in a lot of foods, by the way, I'll do a show on that soon. Cause it's really hard to find. Uh, if you're eating organic food, it's likely not going to have MSG or be GMO or have Roundup in it. But uh, anyway, MSG is super gnarly and it's still in a lot of foods like Doritos and things like that. Uh, Aspartame and other artificial sweeteners, toxic seed oils like canola oil, corn oil, soy oil, and the the kind of uh, sneaky named uh, vegetable oil, (laughs) which means that it's a seed oil and seed oils are toxic and rancid. Uh, trans fats, fried foods, all that stuff. Fluoride, which is in most tap water and bottled and canned drinks, unless they're very well filtered. And then all of the other various toxins like artificial colors and flavors. So on the food piece, honestly, in my opinion, if you have that down and you're sticking to that, you're doing pretty good. Uh, But uh, And you're also a very fortunate person and a privileged person. And congratulations, you won a great karmic uh, score of a birth and you probably have your food game close enough to be healthy. In my opinion, however, if you're putting that much effort and probably money, if you're eating organic and eating high quality food um, into your life and not addressing your energetic and light environment, you miss the key to lasting health and vitality. Now, before I get started, I want to say if you have your interest peaked here about EMF and you enjoy this episode and you want to feast on five plus hours worth of video content all about EMF, make sure to register for the EMF Home Safety Masterclass. 
class I recently created and uh, released unto the world, where you will learn in detail about every single source of EMF in your life and how to fix it one sane step at a time. If you want to register for the class, you can go to lukestory.com slash EMF masterclass to enroll. The entire seven modules, six bonus videos, and three PDF downloads is only $149. Yes, that is not a typo. $149 for the whole shebang. And the content is offered on demand, so you can study it whenever you want, as often as you want, for as long as you want. Lifetime access, $149 at lukestory.com slash EMF masterclass. All right, enough of the commercial. Let's get started with the free class today. First off, what are EMFs? Well, EMFs stand for electromagnetic fields or frequencies. There are a few different varieties, all of which harm biological organisms, some worse than others. We're going to talk about those. EMFs that naturally occur in the environment are universal and very supportive of life, generally speaking. So solar radiation from the sun, you know, in moderation, and of course, the Earth's magnetic field, for example. The EMF we're talking about here is known as non-native EMF, as it's unnatural and created by humans and human-made technology. The various types of EMF that we want to look out for include radio frequencies, or what's commonly called RF. RF uses non-ionizing radiation to carry data over the airwaves. This includes, but is not limited to, smart meters, cell phones and towers, cordless phones, even on the charging station. Microwave ovens, Bluetooth-enabled devices, x-rays, MRIs, computers, baby monitors. Hey, moms, no shame, but man, do not use a wireless baby monitor. They're extremely high in EMF, for real. They're crazy, crazy bad. Uh, Wi-Fi, aviation radar, motion sensors, radio transmitters, and wireless or smart appliances. So those are the ones that are going to emit Uh, radio frequencies, or RF. Then we've got electric fields, wiring in buildings, power cables, computers, televisions, light fixtures, wall outlets, and various electronics, especially when they're plugged in. Then we'll go into magnetic fields, appliances with motors, hair dryers, electric toothbrushes, vibrating sex toys. Yes, seriously, I really mean that. And if you're going to use a vibrating sex toy, by the way, you should definitely check out the uh, taboo product at surthrival.com, seriously. Uh, but I would not use vibrating sex toys. They make crazy magnetic fields. I guess unless you use them really quickly. I don't know. Uh, automobiles, your car engine produces an insane magnetic field. Power lines and faulty wiring in buildings. Then we've got dirty electricity, a type of electric field that is chaotic and disorganized. Dimmer switches cause dirty electricity. I just took all mine out of my house. It was quite a project. Uh, fluorescent bulbs faulty wiring, poorly designed or managed power grids, and some appliances and tech devices will turn the electricity in your house dirty. Not dirty in the good way, like I was talking about with the sex toys and Sir Thrival's taboo, but dirty, as I said, in a chaotic and much more damaging electric field. Then we have a lesser known EMF, but one that has actually been known uh, since all of recorded history. It's called geopathic stress. And this is a natural form of EMS that's created by the sun's magnetic field when it meets cracks in the surface of the earth, known as ley lines or fault lines, or even underground veins of running water. In fact, when I had my house tested, and those of you in the EMF course will see this, uh, Brian Hoyer, the building biologist who came in and tested my home, found really uh, strong geopathic stress zones in the bedroom, specifically right under the bed. I mean, like of all places. So what that indicates to us was that um, there's likely a water main going right under the house and it happens to be right under the bedroom. Now, I did manage to fix it with some sort of uh, spooky wizardry technology, but it is definitely a problem. And, um, And humankind through antiquity was aware of geopathic stress to the point where Uh, humans would use dousing rods to detect where these stress zones are or these cracks in the surface of the earth and not uh, build their encampments or buildings there. And I hypothesize that many buildings that you see um, in your local town or city that have had multiple businesses go in and out of that building and they all fail, my guess is that it's bad mojo from geopathic stress. It's like creates negative energy. It doesn't feel good being in there. Again, that's just my theory. I don't know if that's in fact true. But geopathic stress is a real thing. Okay, next thing is blue light. Now, although not technically an EMF, I include non-native blue light in my EMF mitigation strategy because it's an alien source of biological stress 
created by modern technology. Non-native blue light is light outside of the sun's natural spectrum of color, emitting a very narrow range of light, which is disruptive to our circadian biology. So when people refer to blue light, they refer to light that appears to be bright white. And this light is extremely damaging to your eyes, brain, hormones, neurotransmitters, and especially sleep as a result of jacking up your melatonin. Well, not jacking it up, but actually stopping your body from producing it. Daytime exposure is bad enough, but after dark exposure is catastrophic in the long term, primarily due to blue light's ability to destroy your body's melatonin production, which in turn, of course, as I said, damages sleep quality. But the blue light thing is about a lot more than melatonin. It's a cascade and quite frankly, a complete shit show when it comes to your health and general sense of well-being. Next, we're going to cover light flicker. Now, like blue light, light flicker is not an EMF per se, but it is a non-native alien source of light that is not present in our natural environment. So light created by the sun does not flicker. Junk artificial light produced by LED and fluorescent bulbs, phones and computers and whatnot uh, turns on and off some 60 times per second. Now, it's too fast to visually interpret but it's still damaging to your eyes and brain. Light flicker can cause eye strain, headaches, brain fog, and even dizziness and vertigo. In fact, personally, if I'm under flickering lights, like in a target or something, uh, my brain starts to just melt. I can't stand light flicker. And in fact, my whole home is wired with incandescent bulbs to avoid flicker and blue light. Light flicker can cause eye strain, headaches, brain fog, and even dizziness and vertigo. And in fact, I do everything I can to avoid light flicker because it turns my brain to mush. I hate it. Like if I walk into Target and they've got those LED bulbs going, man, it just makes me feel crazy. Uh, To the point that in fact, I replaced all of the bulbs in my home with pretty amber incandescent vintage Edison style bulbs, which do not flicker and do not create blue light. Some proven physical consequences of EMF exposure include oxidative stress, endocrine or hormone system disruption, immune system damage, mineral depletion, especially magnesium, and the creation of free radicals. Some of the common symptoms of EMF exposure include sleep disturbances, including insomnia, headaches, depression, and depressive symptoms, tiredness and fatigue, Lack of concentration, changes in memory, dizziness, irritability, loss of appetite and weight loss, restlessness and anxiety, nausea, and even skin burning and tingling. And if you dig deeper into EMF, you will discover that there are many links to cancer and many other deadly diseases which have been attributed to chronic and acute EMF exposure. In the show notes, I've included a couple links to scientific journals featuring studies that outline the adverse effects of EMF. Now, I'm not going to read them here on the show because you would never be able to remember them because they're very complex URLs, but just know that they're in the show notes. And if you use a search engine other than Google and start doing some research on EMF, uh, you can find this information quite readily. There's tons and tons of science to support the fact that EMFs uh, are not our friends when it comes to health and longevity. Now, the first thing I want you to remember when learning about EMF, and I'm going to start right here because honestly, this is the most important part, and that's the power of thought. Fear and negativity put a strain on your nervous system, and frankly, living in a state of adrenalized paranoia is probably as bad as the EMF exposure itself. So the key here is to educate yourself and take reasonable steps to limit your EMF exposure little by little over time. Building simple habits like keeping your phone on airplane mode when you're carrying it or sleeping near it, creating distance between you and your Wi-Fi router, hardwiring as many devices as possible, using shielding clothing and accessories, and really spending as much time as possible outdoors in nature in a hopefully sparsely populated area will help minimize the risks of EMF damage. In other words, even if you live in a city and you're getting hammered by EMFs all the time, Just getting out of the city and allowing your body a chance to recuperate will help you a lot. So my advice around mindset and your emotional state is to use positive intentions, thoughts, and prayers whenever you find yourself falling into a fear trap around EMF exposure. So when you see a cell tower, for example, or you look across the room and you see that Wi-Fi router, 
you could say to yourself out loud or just silently something like this. I am an infinite being of consciousness. No harm can come to me. I am pure energy, temporarily using a body as a vehicle. I love myself. God loves me. I am safe and I am protected. Now, you don't have to use those words exactly. Use whatever words fit for you, but it's about the intention and the tendency humans have to be on the lookout for danger at all times. It's kind of that negativity bias. We're just wired to be scanning our environment for threats. And I truly believe that EMF exposure is a very real threat. But in many cases, there's not a lot we can do about it. So falling into that fear and anxiety is going to exacerbate the problem to begin with. So you've got the EMF there, that's bad, but it's even worse when you start to freak out about it. And this is something I've been working on for years because as I interview engineers and scientists and physicists and they explain the science behind EMF, I frankly get really paranoid sometimes and I have to work on this mindset thing myself. So I know there's certain things I can control and there are certain things I can't control. And having a relaxed attitude about EMF is the healthiest approach. All right, that said, now I'm going to freak you out. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, We're going to go into the recent questions about EMF from the Facebook group. And um, that's one of the reasons that I, you know, that I really gave that preface was I know a lot of people in our Facebook group community are really afraid. And I can tell by the way they pose their questions, they are freaked out probably at least in part due to the fact that I've interviewed some very smart people on the show over the past four plus years. And uh, the data is in, the verdict is in, you know what I mean? It's like EMFs jack you up. Uh, But so does walking around adrenalized full of fear. So we're going to try to find some balance. So I'm going to go in and to the best of my ability, answer the questions here from the group. And again, you know, I'm not a physicist, engineer, electrician. I'm doing my best to answer these questions based on my research and personal experience. I will tell you that I have been studying EMF for two decades. And uh, I don't know anyone. um, I don't think. I mean, maybe Ben Greenfield, maybe Brian Hoyer, the guy that I'm going to mention a lot in this uh, episode, who's been on the show a couple of times and is uh, the co-creator of my EMF course. I know very few people put it that way that go to the lengths that I do to shield themselves from EMF. And that's partly because of the education I have about it. And as I said earlier, just because I'm super sensitive to them. I wish I wasn't. I wish I was more resilient. Maybe someday I will be with enough meditation and enough positive affirmations and prayer. But for right now, uh, I find EMF to be very troublesome. And, uh, and that's why I chose to cover it in this show. And that's why I talk about it so much in general. That's why I made a course. And that's why so many people in the Facebook group and on my social media uh, post questions about it. So here's the first one. This one's from Chad. He says, hi, everyone. What's your favorite slash best EMF clothing? 5G proof? I want to go into full body protection. The nervous system has been on edge and the whole digestive system is uh, especially, or the digestive system especially is grinding to a halt. It could be geopathic, faulty electric, or just living in SoCal, uh, from which I'm about to relocate. I think a history of concussions, brain, body, holding on to toxicity is making the EMFs a challenge. My understanding is a safe sleep zone is priority uno. Are there any cost-effective hacks? Right now, I have Blue Shield and Soma Vedic. Ideally, fully shielded in the future. And for those of you that don't know what uh, Chad's talking about, we're going to explain shielding and things like that. Any tips or tricks appreciated? Thank you. And then Chad says, I signed up for Luke's EMF course when it comes out. He must have been on the wait list. It's already out. And again, you can find it at lukestory.com slash EMF masterclass. Okay, so here's the thing I'm going to say to Chad. Uh, First thing is, man, I hear fear in there. And I understand because EMFs are scary as shit straight up. But you have to avoid the fear I would recommend meditating daily. You might be doing some of this, but it's really important that you master your thoughts and master your emotions. Next thing is, and you're going to hear me say this a lot during the course of me answering these questions, is get a home assessment by a building biologist such as Brian Hoyer. As far as EMF clothing, there's three brands I like. Lambs, 
No Choice, and Shield. And they make a variety of things from underwear to beanies to baby blankets and all kinds of stuff. You can find them all in my store. Next is Move Away from High Density Populations. Wherever you live, you can use a site called antennasearch.com to find nearby cell towers to ensure that you're not, you know, as I was, unfortunately, unknowingly living under two giant ass cell towers for three years. Also supplementing with Vital Reaction Hydrogen, 360 Health C60 or Carbon 60, and Magnesium Breakthrough are all potent ways to reduce the cellular damage caused by EMF as well if you take them internally. As for your brain there, Chad, uh, I've had a lot of problems with my brain too for a number of different reasons. I'm working hard on restoring brain function. I'm I'm doing really well with it, uh, frankly, but it's been a commitment of both time, energy, and money. I'd recommend hyperbaric oxygen therapy or HBOT, neurofeedback, and then my gut tells me you might have some heavy metals, as most people do, especially people with cognitive issues. And for that, I would recommend the Quicksilver Scientific black box heavy metals detox. It's a few hundred bucks, but uh, in my research and personal experience, because I've done it at least once, I'm kind of doing another one right now, but it's not the black box. uh, That is the most effective way and the safest way, you know, because the other ways are chelation and different things like that, which can be risky. But this is, in my opinion, the safest way to get heavy metals out of your brain, or at least, you know, get a good start on it. Next question is from Sheridan, and Sheridan says, is there a low EMF iPad cover for a toddler? I'm pregnant with twins, and my energy to entertain in this season is very low. I get it. Everyone's homeschooling stuff. Now, I don't know if your twins are coming after existing kids, but whether or not that's the case, uh, I understand. So here's what I'm going to recommend for Sheridan. Get the Defender Shield Pregnancy Belly Blanket. It's uh, this EMF fabric that's got elastic on both ends. Sort of looks like a little girdle or something like that. You can wear it underneath clothing or over clothing if you're at home. Wear that thing 24-7. Just trust me. Um, <laughs> it, um, embryos and infants, skin and skulls specifically are very thin. Let me just put it that way. No shame on moms here. Like whenever I talk about mother stuff, don't think I'm calling you out and saying you're a bad mom. Listen, we do the best we can. It's like whatever. Like the world's full of EMFs. You you can't do everything right. But um, that Defender Shield pregnancy, pregnancy belly blanket is really cheap, super easy to use and, you know, integrate into your lifestyle. Uh, some of these things you can just kind of habituate yourself to and then they just become automatic. There's also a really cool Defender Shield blanket that you can use to shield small kids. Like you can use it as a baby blanket and it shields RF once they're born. And even for now, you could also just keep that over your belly as often as possible. So if you're working at a computer or watching TV or chilling in any area where there is EMF, which is everywhere, you could put that little blanket right over your pregnant belly and you'd be doing those twins a really big favor. Um, and, uh, let's see, then you can also use the Hera pad or the Defender Shield laptop pad whenever your computer's on your lap. However, I would recommend that you put your computer on a desk or table when you use it and, um, also use the pad even while it's on the table because the radiation will go through a desk or table. So when you're pregnant or especially even if you're planning to get pregnant, I highly recommend that you protect your reproductive organs from radiation emitted from the bottom of laptops and all other devices. And Defender Shield, for answering your question specifically, also makes a great iPad cover. And it's still best not to allow your children to use wireless devices, in my opinion, Uh, but I know this can be tough to resist. So again, no guilt, but something for parents to consider. Uh, Because even if you're using an iPad Shield, the EMF coming off the screen is still really high and Young people and small people, and that would just include your pets too, like any small organism is going to be much more susceptible to EMF. So something to consider, you know, don't be paranoid, do the best you can, but just know that there are solutions available that you can uh, build into your lifestyle. Again, so they just become automatic. You habituate yourself to that practice. Oh, I grab my laptop. I mean, I just keep my laptop. It's got a hair pad attached to it, actually. And it's just, I never take the laptop out of that thing. Um, and so it doesn't really require me to change anything I'm doing. I just don't fry my nuts when I'm on my computer, which is awesome. And I'm sure my kids uh, someday will thank me. 
<laughs> okay, next question is from Cliff. He wants to know about low non-native EMF cooking beside using a fire, LOL. Any thoughts? Uh, I would say that a gas stove is best, also just the best for cooking. I mean, I'm no master chef, but I have tried to cook on electric stoves and I'm I'm just like, what? How is this? How do people even do this? It's really bizarre. Definitely remove the microwave oven from your um, kitchen. And if you can't remove it, unplug it. The only thing they're really suitable for is for storing your phone and devices as microwaves make really great Faraday cages, meaning they block radiation inside. So uh, when I had one in my last apartment, it was definitely unplugged because I just don't even want that thing like thinking about turning on in my house. But I would use it when I was doing a podcast and needed to focus and I would keep my cell phone in there. And it was like a way that I, it's like, double airplane mode, you know, like your phone is unreachable if it's inside a microwave. Also, I would recommend not using fluorescent tube lights that are often in your stove hoods as they are very high EMF and usually cause additional dirty electricity uh, right around your head while you're cooking. If you don't have a gas line into the house, replace your electric stove with a propane fueled gas stove if you can afford it. Many rural homes actually run on propane, which is more expensive than natural gas, but unless you're heating a pool, it won't make much difference in monthly expenses. Toaster ovens are safe as long as you keep your distance while they're on. They do emit a strong electric field, as do all space heaters. Heads up. Next question is from Jamie. How do you rank the lesser of EMF evils for an iPhone? I love this question. This is really good because it was so easy to answer. So she says uh, her options are iPhone on speakerphone holding in your hand, uh, iPhone wired headset, iPhone Bluetooth earbuds or earbuds. You know what I'm going to say about that. So here are your phone options from best to worst. No matter how you're using your phone, always keep it in a Defender Shield case. And once you've dialed or answered, close the case to block radiation coming from the front of the phone. Number two. If there's Wi-Fi available, keep your phone on airplane mode, deactivating cellular service and Bluetooth. Then use Wi-Fi to make your calls. This way, you're not pinging local cell towers with your phone's antenna or radiating yourself with added RF from the Bluetooth unnecessarily. In other words, Wi-Fi on your phone is the lowest radiation in terms of getting service. So if you can turn all the other services off, why not? You don't need Bluetooth or cell service if you can make a call on Wi-Fi. And likewise, by the way, if you can't make a call on Wi-Fi, turn off your Wi-Fi and turn off your Bluetooth while you're using your phone and just use this cellular service. Number three, if you must use cell service, use AirBuds by Defender Shield, not earbuds, but AirBuds. These are safer than regular wired headsets as they do not carry EMF to your ears and keep your phone as far away from you as possible while you're using it. Number four, the next best thing is using speakerphone with your cell phone away from your body with the Defender Shield case closed. Fifth, the second to worst way to make calls is using wireless Bluetooth earbuds. This irradiates your brain. And radiating your brain is not something you want to play with. Like if you can avoid it, why do it? Number six, the very worst way to use your phone is by holding it to your head. I would personally never put Bluetooth earbuds or a phone near my head unless it was an absolute emergency. I do this every once in a while if I land at an airport and it's really loud and I have to talk to a an Uber driver because they refuse to text me and they just keep calling me over and over again. By the way, if you're an Uber driver, don't do that. It's annoying. Just use text in your car. Like you won't crash. It's okay. I promise. Uh, But seriously, I definitely would avoid using those Bluetooth earbuds. Sometimes I'm on podcasts with people and they have those in and I'm biting my lip the whole time. Just going, Luke, don't be codependent. Like it's none of your business. Don't be controlling. If they want to fry their brain, let them. Uh, But it's hard to resist because I know how much radiation they emit because I've tested them. They are gnarly. The next question comes from Joe. How do you guys feel about EMF blocking phone cases like Defender Shield? To me, phone cases like the one Defender Shield makes are exceptional. But keep in mind, they're only going to prevent radiation coming from the face of your phone. So it's still a good idea to keep the phone as far away from your body as possible while using it. And based on my research, Defender Shield makes the best case. And as I said, with all this stuff, you can find them in the EMF section of my website. Uh, There's links and discounts and all that stuff in there. 
Um, it, you know, and this episode is not like a giant commercial for my site. It's just, honestly, that's the easiest place to find stuff. So I'm going to mention that from time to time. I'm not trying to be cheesy. I'm going to make like a dollar fifty if you get the damn case. Trust me. <laughs> it's not going to buy me a Ferrari anytime soon, but, uh, whatever. Every little bit helps. Next question is from Christina. She says, forgive if this is a silly question. Is EMF radiation to a certain extent where you could take things like modified citrus pectin? pectin or apple pectin to detox your intestines to the effects, of course, also using the blue shield as well. Or are we talking about different radiation? Thanks. Uh, Christina, that's not a silly question at all. I get it. This stuff is really complex and I'm still learning after 20 years of being into this. So, uh, you know, it's not stupid at all. Uh, Radiation is radiation. Uh, After all, there are different types though. However, the radiation you're talking about that you would use something internally to get rid of is radiation from nuclear waste, radiated food products, x-rays, et cetera. It's called ionizing radiation. And that's the worst kind. That's the Narnar stuff, like Chernobyl vibes. EMF radiation is non-ionizing radiation. So yes, activated charcoal, bentonite clay, apple pectin, and all the various binders that can bind to radioactive isotopes in your GI tract and remove them are great but they're not going to affect the levels of radiation in your environment or going through the airwaves like the type we've discussed here. So I'm all for taking binders and getting rid of all poisons in your body periodically. I love to do cleanses. I'm in the middle of doing a Quicksilver Scientific one right now, uh, wherein I'm using their activated charcoal product, but that is not going to do anything as far as I know to help me with the Wi-Fi router that is right over there in the room right now because I'm live streaming and I haven't gotten around to hardwiring my two iPads as of yet. And I probably won't until I buy a house. It's another story altogether. It's covered in the EMF course. How about that? Next question is from Joe. He says, hey, peeps, we dedicate quite a bit of discussion here to EMF. And I've been curious to hear people's descriptions of what it feels like to be around EMF for different periods. I'm trying to sort out how sensitive I am to it and want to get a feel for what people mean when they say they are EMF sensitive or hypersensitive and so on. So that's my question slash prompt for discussion. What does it feel like in your body to be around EMF? My answer to that would be, it depends on each person's nervous system response. People who've experienced a lot of trauma, for example, tend to have limbic system damage, which results in higher sensitivity to things like EMF and chemicals. And that would definitely be the case for me, having been someone that was put through and put myself through a lot earlier in life. Additionally, duration and proximity have a massive effect on how your body responds to exposure as well. When I'm exposed to high-level EMF, like modern automobiles, uh, being near cell towers or high-powered Wi-Fi, My symptoms include ringing ears, brain fog, extreme fatigue and grogginess, and sometimes insomnia, followed by excruciating morning headaches. But that's just me. You know, some people don't seem to be affected by EMF at all, although I would argue that all living beings are affected negatively by EMF, some worse than others, based on their resilience to it. So there's not really a way, Joe, to my knowledge, to test out kind of how it feels um, other than the symptoms that I just uh, indicated. However, those symptoms could also be caused just by making other poor lifestyle choices, right? I mean, go eat some Chinese food and you'll probably have those, I mean, Chinese food with MSG, let me clarify, and you'll probably have those symptoms too. Okay, next one's from Kelly. I was told by my doctor to reduce EMF exposure due to Hashimoto's, possibly Lyme and EBV. I started doing research, which led me to this podcast. Well, that's great, Kelly. And listen, my heart goes out to um, any one of those would be challenging. Having all three of them could be a bitch. But uh, remember, your body has the perfect blueprint for perfect health and resilience, and you can heal. Absolutely. I've seen miracles in my 20 years uh, being into alternative healing and natural medicine. Like, you can fix it. You can fix it. You can fix everything. She says, I'm feeling defeated in this area after reading and listening to all the information. Sorry about that. (laughs) My bad. That's kind of my job, but I know sometimes it's a bummer when you listen to this show and the interviews and you're like, oh, wow, life's a lot harder than I thought. 
She says, I feel like I can't protect my eight-year-old and my husband and 20-year-old want nothing to do with reducing EMFs. Uh, It just seems as if doing what you can, quote, end quote, isn't enough. Like, ah, do what you can, which is, you know, kind of what I recommend. But I also recommend that just to not overwhelm people. You know, that's the thing. Uh, So she says, anyone else feel like this? My answer to Kelly is it can be challenging to wade through the science and also to use discernment um, when it comes to knowing who to trust for recommendations. It's also much more challenging to reduce EMF in your home and in your lifestyle if your family is not on board. So my suggestions are as follows. The first thing to do, and you guys are going to hear me say this all the time, is to hire a building biologist like Brian Hoyer. And you don't have to hire him, but he's the best one I know. He's probably booked from me recommending him so much on the show, but uh, a trained EMF mitigation specialist. It's just like if you suspect you have mold, you hire a mold mitigation specialist where there's people that do that for EMF, some better than others. Brian's the best that I've found. Um, The guesswork is really draining. Just trying to figure it out yourself is going to drive you crazy. Plus, you might find that your home is not as bad as you'd guessed. Um, I had a friend of mine have an EMF assessment who lives on the west side of Los Angeles and He's not on the ocean, but he faces the ocean on one side within a few blocks. And the EMF in his apartment was really low. And he's in the middle of LA. So go figure. I would have never guessed that. But he only had to do a couple small mitigations and he's good to go. He's got a clean environment. So sometimes it's worse. Sometimes it's um, not as bad as you think, but you don't know until you have it professionally tested. But at least you'll have a starting point. And I'm guessing if your 20-year-old kid and husband see and hear these EMF meters in action, it will likely get them uh, on board for, you know, at least a, a little bit more of a commitment than they are now. I mean, when you see someone come in, it's like, doo, 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 rah, 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 zh, zh, zh. it's kind of alarming. Lots of bells and whistles. And um, because EMFs are invisible, people don't think they're real. But when you see, you know, $25,000 worth of equipment lighting up and buzzing and making all kinds of crazy noises, it tends to get your attention, especially when you see the wide eyes of the building biologist go, oh man, this isn't good as they're listening to all the buzzing and beeping. So seeing is believing, as they say. I would also add a harmonizing device like a Soma Vedic or Blue Shield to the house. And uh, no one even needs to know that you installed it and they will still benefit. In other words, like just hide it in the closet or something. You don't have to tell your smart ass 20 year old and husband about it. They're just going to get a more harmonious field in the house. Now, these things don't block EMF, but they definitely help create a more harmonious energy field inside the home. So I still recommend getting rid of EMF, blocking it, shielding it dealing with it, but I do for sure like the Soma Vedic and Blue Shield devices. And there's other things coming out in the market too that I'm researching now that do similar kind of, you know, harmonic harmonization. And I'm a huge fan of that. Uh, but that's because I also have a, a, you know, Flintstonian understanding of quantum physics. And I know that there is a world beyond particle. It's called the world of wave. And these type of devices work on wave. And that's why science geeks and skeptics don't understand them and don't like them. And I tell them, just go live under a cell tower, leave me alone. Sometimes like, you know, the real like, I want to see the data. Guys give me shit because they think these things are bunk. Like sometimes someone on YouTube will take apart a, one of these EMF harmonizers and they, they don't understand the circuitry inside. So they claim that it's bunk and it's a ripoff. And I personally know those two products are not. Um, so that annoys me, but it's okay, you know? <laughs> People deserve to have their point of view and their opinion. I will talk about the little phone stickers and stuff in a little bit. I think a lot of those are bogus, but um, those two devices are great. Oh, I know what I wanted to answer here too, actually, while we're at it. This is a really common question. That is, uh, which is better, Soma Vedic or Blue Shield? Many people listening to this will know what I'm talking about. Those of you that don't, these are, again, devices that create... um, an energetic field in your living space that render you less susceptible to the stress of EMF. So again, they don't block it, but they create a harmonious field. I've made some amazing videos about these products. You can find them on my site and the site store. They're like 15, 20 minutes, like deep dive documentary style reports on these. I cannot say that Soma Vedic or Blue Shield is better. I just won't do it. People try to push me on my DMs all the time. Just tell me, just tell me like I'm holding on to some secret and I don't want them to know. There literally is no way to pick because they essentially do the same thing, 
but they do it using different technology in a different way. So personally, I have both of them all over my house. You don't need them all over your house. You just need one typically of each. Uh, They cover quite a wide area, but I'm just extra and I'm just a freak about EMF. So I figure more is better. It's probably not. Don't do like I do. (laughs) Do like I say, just get one. Make sure it's appropriate for your, you know, your house size. And then I also have them in my car and I also travel with these things because as I said, I just get wrecked, man, especially when I'm traveling. Sometimes I end up in a hotel room and there's a Wi-Fi router behind the bed or something weird like that. And I just get tweaked. So I like to create a nice uh, harmonic field wherever I go. And then as always, uh, let me scroll up to see Kelly. As always, do your best to keep your Wi-Fi off at night uh, when people are sleeping. I know if you have a 20-year-old, they might not be keeping the same hours as you and the hubby. But uh, what I do is I just keep mine on a timer. There's also a Wi-Fi kill switch so that you can manually turn it off when you know everyone's asleep. That might be something that works better for you. Uh, I find it to be a little bit of a pain in the ass to go turn off or unplug the Wi-Fi router every night. Uh, just because they're usually tucked away in a closet or something like that, and they're not generally reachable. Uh, Also, just as another tip here for everyone, I would highly recommend that you do not keep your Wi-Fi router near where you spend most of your time. And I am so guilty of not practicing what I preach right now because I'm in my office slash podcast studio, and the Wi-Fi router is like probably... 12 feet away from my head. And that is really bad. And I don't like it. But again, I keep thinking I'm going to move out of this house, which I'm leasing and buy a house, which I will. I just don't know when the COVID thing happened. Everything got jacked up. So I don't know what's up. But in a perfect world, I would have no Wi-Fi in the house at all and just have Ethernet cables poking out all over the place that you can plug your devices into. Uh, Or I would keep the Wi-Fi really far away from my office and far away from the bedroom and also turn it off at night when sleeping. We'll be right back at you after this brief but important announcement. This episode of the Lifestylist Podcast would literally not be possible without the support of our sponsor, Blue Blocks. Blue Blocks offers a complete range of evidence-backed blue light blocking glasses to suit your every need. And they also look really cool. Their signature sleep lenses block 100% of the blue and green light from the 400 to 550 nanometer range, giving you optimal melatonin release and the best sleep ever. They also have daytime blue light glasses for when you're working on a computer or recording a podcast like this. Often I use the yellow lenses because I don't want it to get too dark and I don't want to get too tired. I don't want to produce too much melatonin because I need to work here in the studio on the computer. So I kind of have like different blue blocks for all different times of the day. But after say eight, nine o'clock at night, then I'm rocking the darker kind of amber color lenses in the 550 range because I want to get tired and start winding down and going to sleep. They offer a full range of non-prescription, prescription, prescription, and readers with free worldwide shipping. They also have a really cool service where you can send in your own frames, which is dope. So you might have some great sunglasses, which I don't recommend wearing personally. It's a whole other topic. Uh, I don't wear sunglasses myself, but I have turned some of my other sunglasses into blue blockers, which is really cool. So I would highly recommend if you care about your sleep, and you want some good-looking blue-blocking eyewear to protect yourself from computers and lights at night and all that kind of stuff, get yourself over to blueblocks.com. That's B-L-U-B-L-O-X, B-L-U-B-L-O-X, blueblocks.com. And when you get there, at checkout, enter the code LIFESTYLIST and save 15% off. And now, back to the interview. Sarah asks, I can't sleep on my metal coil mattress anymore without tossing and turning over the microwave EMF conductive frequencies. I hear you, girl. I've been there. Um, And by the way, it's quite astute of you to know that many people do not realize that they're frying themselves on a metal spring mattress, which I'll cover in a second. So she says, I'm looking to get fancy bedding free of metal, but I'm sleeping on an air mattress until then. Anyone with similar bedding hacks? Thanks. Now, this makes perfect sense to me, Sarah, as metal coils in mattresses do turn your entire bed into a massive EMF antenna. Womp, womp. Sorry to freak you guys out that are sleeping on metal beds. Uh, You'll learn why and then take logical, sane steps over time to make changes if you feel so called. 
Those of us who are old enough to remember televisions with the wire antenna on top will know that if your signal wasn't strong enough, you'd wire uh, coat hangers and tin foil to the existing antenna to create a larger conductive surface area. And that's precisely, and unfortunately, what metal spring beds do. In fact, I wouldn't even own a bed myself uh, that has a metal frame, let alone a mattress. Now, when I travel, I'm probably sleeping on them all the time. I think positive. I pray. I'm emotionally happy. Have a good time. Don't worry about it. I also did a solo show all about healthy mattresses in episode 236. And I will say that the organic or healthy mattress marketing out there is so confusing and competitive. It's really hard to keep up with. I mean, when I did that last episode, I did some digging online. I was like, oh my God, there's like so much mudslinging and misinformation. It's crazy. It's kind of like the sauna industry. They're very much the same way. I think people in the sauna industry, um, I don't know, there seems to be a lot of scarcity and fear about, you know, other people having sauna companies. <laughs> there's there's few products in the health world that are very competitive. They're very cutthroat. Saunas and mattresses are probably the top two. Uh, so I personally, and I'm embarrassed to admit this honestly, as a health and wellness advocate, and one that you know, I guess has some degree of influence. I still have a goddamn Casper mattress. It was a thousand dollars. I got it like four years ago, and you know, it's not perfect, but it's also not incredibly toxic. It passed the environmental standards. It doesn't have flame retardant. It doesn't have springs. And frankly, it's really comfortable and it's lasted this whole time. It doesn't sag. It's awesome. My girlfriend loves it. I love it. So for now, it's good. Um, having a chili pad or actually the Uller uh, cooling and or heating device also helps a lot. It's not only just really soft and you can barely detect it, but it just gets the temperature right. So I probably would hate my Casper mattress if I didn't have the Uller because the Casper is probably hot as shit. And so um, I'm getting kind of a, an upgraded Casper because I have the Uller. However, rather than spend thousands of dollars on a deluxe mattress, I would definitely invest in a Magnetico sleep pad, which creates a natural earth-like magnetic field with incredible health benefits. I've been sleeping on one of these for about 10 years. Now, they're not cheap, but you only buy them once in a lifetime and you have them forever. I've had mine for a long, long time. And um, these not only do not attract EMFs, but they also have the net effect of repelling EMFs because they produce... Um, a really healthy, natural magnetic field, as I said, underneath you as you sleep. They're really cool. But as far as the mattresses go, here's a few brands I've looked into. And again, this stuff's changing all the time. It's very competitive. It's hard to keep up with. But I did find that uh, the mattresses by the name of Avocado, who are marketed as these organic, healthy, latex mattresses, etc., they have metal coils, dog. So Avocado, if you're listening, you guys are blowing it big time. So no dice on the Avocado. A really great band, uh, brand is Essentia. Now, Essentia are one of the best for sure, but also one of the most expensive. Last I checked, they're running anywhere between like two and seven thousand dollars. So they're they're getting up there into the Mercedes of uh, mattress territory. There's another great brand called Satva, uh, spelled S A A T V A, and another one that a friend of mine has. My friend James uh, bought one of these and he loves it. It's called Zen Haven. So there's, you know, three good ones for you right there to start with. However, drum roll, please. The Rolls Royce of organic mattresses and why I still have a Casper is uh, Samina. Now, once I can afford one of their beds, I will definitely invest. Like the Magnetico mattress pads, Samina is a one-time purchase. You buy the sleep system, the whole bed, the frame, everything, you're done. That's the last bed you ever own till the day you croak. And you can learn all about Samina Sleep Systems in episode number 16. I would definitely recommend going back to that. It's it's probably a, a lost treasure of an episode because it was when the podcast first came out in 2016. I bet a lot of people haven't heard that, but it's a serious deep dive into sleep and mattresses. And you can also find my mini documentary on Samina Beds on YouTube. It's called The Healthiest Bed in the World. It's a 45-minute documentary about the Samina sleep system because it's not just a mattress. It's a whole thing. And I did a, you know, a, a very thorough video all about it. You can find it on YouTube. And um, you're also going to learn a lot about healthy bedding and sleep in that number 16 video and podcast, as mentioned. 
The next question is from Quentin. He says, public service announcement. Check your building and surroundings for cell towers. I just discovered this disaster of an EMF nightmare right above my apartment. Been living here five years. I'm assuming he posted a photo there. I'll have to go back and check it out. And uh, I got to say, Quentin, I relate, brother. I've been there. And it is truly a nightmare to discover you're living near a cell tower. A rude awakening indeed. Here's what you guys can do, though. You can use a site called antennasearch.com to locate towers near any U.S. address before moving or working anywhere. Very valuable resource. His first question is, is there a medical test I can get to trace potential health risks? My answer would be, since EMF radiation is energetic and not a toxin per se, that can be measured in your body, I don't know how to assess exposure damage, really. Um, It's going to cause inflammation and oxidative stress, but there's no way to test for that and prove that that inflammation and oxidative stress was indeed caused by EMF. I mean, just living life causes oxidative stress, so you would never know. Okay, question two. He says, can I sue the building for not advising the tenants on this? Building owners get paid from cell phone companies to install them. Yes, this is true. This is one of the problems, uh, Quentin, in the industry. You are correct. That is the telecommunications industry has more money than the pharmaceutical industry. You always hear about big pharma. Uh, Big tele or big telecom is infinitely more power, uh, powerful and wealthy and have equal, if not more, lobbying power when it comes to legislation. So we know how corrupt our government is. If you don't, uh, you might consider waking up to that fact, but they are not to be trusted. Uh, the way this works is telecommunications companies, like let's say you know Verizon, they find a building that is strategically located and they want to put up a cell tower on the roof. They would contact the owner of that building, and they would lease the space to put that up there. Same with your apartment building, Quentin. Um, They also pay cities to use light posts and things like that. So there's a lot of money in being on the receiving end of a cell tower installation. In other words, like if I own this house and you know T-Mobile came to me and said, hey, I'm going to give you $4,000 a month to put a tower uh, on the side of your house, If I didn't know that I was harming my neighbors and myself, I'd probably be like, yeah, hell yeah, awesome. Just don't make it look ugly, which is what happened when I lived under the cell towers. They had put up a faux wall to hide the towers because they were so unsightly. And that's why I didn't know to not move there. Had I seen them, I would have been like, not only are those things hideous, but I don't feel like getting brain cancer. So I'm not moving into this building. My answer, though, Quentin, is that uh, I'm no attorney, so I'm not sure about the liability here, but I doubt much can be done unless you've actually become ill, such as uh, with something like cancer, and can actually prove the EMF caused it. What you can do, though, is check out takebackyourpower.net for tons of excellent legal advice and support. It's an amazing site and a documentary and They're really doing a lot uh, to combat the uh, rollout of 5G, et cetera. So it's a very politically active website with tons of great links and information in terms of finding attorneys and learning the laws and all of that. So again, that's takebackyourpower.net and make sure to watch their documentary too. It's uh, mostly based on smart meters, but there's a lot of great information in there that's um, quite inflammatory to the big telecommunications companies. Question three from Quentin. Well, getting a little greedy there, Quentin, huh? No, just kidding. He says, uh, does anyone have a recommendation of the best EMF slash radiation tracker device to check levels? I think what he means is an EMF meter. I like that tracker device, though. A tracker device is your cell phone because you're getting COVID traced. Different podcasts altogether. Answer here. Again, there are a few amateur uh, EMF meters on my site. You can find them on Amazon, et cetera. And it's worth having a couple around, but this will never replace a professional home assessment. So the cheaper ones will give you a general idea of EMF levels and the location of their sources. But in terms of really creating a safe home, I would definitely not rely on them. Uh, I tried that and failed. In fact, when I moved into the home I'm currently living in, When I came to uh, look at it with the realtor, I had my EMF meters and I tested for 
uh, RF because I didn't want to be near a cell tower. And there was really low uh, RF here and my phone didn't work. So I was stoked. Then when I moved in, I had it tested for magnetic fields and the magnetic fields were off the charts because it was not wired to code. So the wiring in the house has airs in it that produce electric fields and magnetic fields and dirty electricity. And it's real nasty. However, I have fixed it and you can learn how I fixed it in my EMF course. Next question is from Molly. She says, for those of you that work in an office setting, what have you done to make your desk as low EMF as possible? I know just being in the office is pretty bad, but does anyone have any tricks to make their workspace as low EMF as possible? Well, yes, Molly. In fact, I do have some tricks for you, girl. Here we go. For this, you can install harmonizing devices, which will definitely help. Again, they're not going to block EMF, but they're going to make you feel a hell of a lot better. Wearing EMF clothing at work. So I'd recommend that you just wrap yourself in tinfoil. No, I'm just kidding. You can use the clothing I mentioned earlier. No one will even know. Well, the no choice hoodie is silver. You're going to look like a space woman. Uh, It's kind of cool. I am mad at it. I drive around it. I fly in it. Uh, But you can get the lambs. Uh, undergarments and t-shirts. You can get the uh, beanies and baseball caps and uh, hoodies from Shield. Again, they're all on my site. So at least while you're sitting at your desk for long periods, uh, that would definitely help. Now, it just depends on the dress code and how comfortable you feel looking like you just you know went to the gym or something, which is what most of this EMF clothing looks like. It's kind of plain or active wear style, I guess you could say. Another thing you can do is have your computer hardwired to Ethernet, if possible, and turn off its Wi-Fi. Also, use a wired mouse and keyboard and turn off the Bluetooth on your computer if you don't need it or when you don't need it. In fact, mine's on right here because I have a trackpad that is not wired because I just have to work with the trackpad. I can't stand mice. So again, some of this advice I'm giving you, it's funny as I'm sitting here, I'm like, Luke, you don't do that. But just like my stepdad, uh, or no, he wasn't my stepdad. They weren't married. Um, one of my mom's boyfriends smoked a lot of weed when I was a kid and I used to watch him and I wanted some and he'd be, he'd say, uh, what do you say? Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> I always remember that one. Anyway, I digress. Uh, next piece of advice is this, um, depending on how weird you can act or look at your job. And again, you know, like if you work at a tech startup with a bunch of young hipsters, they're not going to care if you get weird, but if you're in a more corporate job, this could definitely get awkward. But you could, if you wanted to, install shielding fabric from shielded healing around your desk. You could create kind of a little Faraday shield. If you have your own office, if you're like, you know, VP, exec position, you could have the walls painted with shielding paint. You could uh, have EMF shielded fabric sewn onto your curtains or window coverings. If you really want to like Faraday out your office, I mean, you're speaking more about your desk. So I'm going to cover that, but I don't know what your work situation is exactly. So I'm being extra thorough here. And I'll also say, again, this is tough without testing as you really need to determine the level of EMF in the room, the types of EMF, and from which direction it's coming. So you might be in an office environment that's not as bad as you think, although it could be way worse than you could ever imagine. Another trick would be um, keeping anything that's plugged into power far away from your body just to avoid those electric fields. You can also get a shielded computer cable from Shielded Healing. Also, don't work near a cordless telephone. Sometimes I'll go into like a reception at a hotel or something and they have a cordless phone sitting right next to their face all day. Cordless phones are brutal when it comes to EMF. And if you must work near a cordless phone, you can just easily cover it with shielding fabric, cut out a little, you know, one foot square patch of fabric and just cover the phone when you're sitting there. Uh, It'll still work. It'll still ring. It just won't blast you in the head while you're hanging out there. Also keep your cell phone on airplane mode or out of reach and use your computer for texting instead of your phone. So often when I'm sitting here at my iMac, which is where I'm recording right now, I'll just keep my phone in the other room so it's not distracting and creating unnecessary EMF. And then I just do text from my computer. So I really don't need my phone uh, nearby. And frankly, having your phone near you at work is really bad for productivity, generally speaking. Is it so easy to grab your phone and start geeking out on Instagram or whatever your poison social media of choice is? Next question is from Courtney. Low radiation and EMF headphones for speaking on the phone? 
needing to reduce phone to head contact, but need calls to be private, not on speakerphone. Thanks in advance. Yeah, I get it. Courtney, what are you, what are you talking about there, girl? Uh, as I mentioned before, use the Defender Shield Airbuds. They sound great. They sound totally normal, but they don't fry your brain while using your phone and still keep your phone a few feet away from you and inside a Defender Shield case face up. Uh, the Defender Shield cases only block radiation coming out of the front, which is the part where you hear and talk into. And that's why I said face up. And, you know, with EMF in general, you guys, it's all about distance. Proximity is your friend. So, you know, you can't like avoid all EMF, but if you start to just be mindful about how far away you are from the different sources, which just think about anything that's plugged into the wall or anything that is sending and receiving data wirelessly is going to have some level of EMF. So you don't have to be crazy about it. Again, don't be paranoid about it. Just get in the habit of kind of pushing everything away from you when you're sitting at your desk. And from Brian, we get, my wife is hell-bent on painting a portion of our dining room, and I'm wondering what to do since there is a cell tower about three quarters of a mile away from us behind the wall with the windows. I've wanted to get a building biologist here to do the proper testing and get appropriate recommendations, as I know that's the answer. But does it make sense at all to paint that wall with a shielded paint? It's on the lower level, and we don't spend a ton of time directly in that room, but it would potentially block a decent amount of radiation. Yes, Brian, you are correct. It sure would if you have the right kind of paint. Uh, so obviously, Brian already knows the importance of getting accurate readings, as I keep indicating over and over again. So that said, in the meantime, uh, if it was me, I would for sure paint the wall facing the towers with shielding paint and have shielding fabric sewn onto the curtains of window coverings. And again, you can find both of those on my site. It's something you can do relatively easy yourself. I mean, unless you're a seamstress, you know, you can do that part yourself, but it's super easy to just take your curtains down, take the fabric to a tailor and just have them sew it on. Um, now, because the radiation is coming from one direction, that's the only time that I would recommend just shielding one wall, and that's only because you absolutely know it's just coming from that side. However, if you were to shield the wall on the other side of the room facing the cell signal, it could have a negative impact because it could just bounce those signals around the room. So it gets a little tricky. Uh, speaking of bouncing, here's a little tidbit for you guys that might be interesting. You know how some closets have those um, mirrors on them? Uh, mirrors actually bounce and reflect EMF signals. So uh, I recommend not having any large mirrors in your bedroom, just as a side note. So thanks, Brian, for the question. Next question is from Keisha. Does food pick up radiation from an airplane flight as humans do? So I think Keisha is talking about solar radiation. So when we're flying in airplanes at 30,000 feet, the theory is that because we're so much closer to the sun that we are exposed to solar radiation. Now, I've heard tons of extremely brilliant people indicate that this is in fact true and that this has a lot to do with why uh, rates of cancer are so prevalent for people that work in air travel, pilots, uh, flight attendants, etc. Then again, I've also heard people that I trust and uh, rely on for information say that that is false, that that is in fact fake news, that you don't get more solar radiation from flying at 35,000 feet. Common sense would tell me if you're that much closer to the sun, you're going to get more radiation. Uh, I would be led to believe that because I know that it's much easier to get sunburn when you're on top of a mountain uh, in the middle of the summer, that is when the sun is overhead, uh, as opposed to further south, as it would be in the fall and winter, etc. But uh, I think the sun is much stronger when you're closer to it. So I think that I would say you are getting more radiation, uh, not to mention you're flying in a metal tube, which would be conductive, I think. So that's that. Uh, as far as the food getting that radiation, I'm not sure. But you know what does give your food radiation? Putting it through the x-ray when you go through security. What you can do to stop your food from being irradiated as it goes through TSA checkpoints is wrapping it in tinfoil. Super easy fix. And I used to do this with all my supplements, all my food and everything. And um, then I just got lazy. Then I bought like a 
kind of a foil Faraday bag, some superfoods that you'll buy in bulk, like you buy a big bag of maca or rhodiola or whatever, they'll come in like a silver Faraday bag to protect the nutritional value of said superfood or herb. And so you can actually use those or you can buy Faraday plastic Ziplocs online and just keep your food in that when you go through TSA. You know, sometimes I'm going to be honest, I get lazy and I just don't do that anymore. But there were there were years where every time I traveled, I had like my food bag and I would even wrap tinfoil around all of my little supplement bottles and I was quite fastidious about it. Uh, but uh, I've gotten a bit more lax over the years because it's just like, you know, as you might've guessed, I'm pretty next level with everything I do. So you just can't do everything. But that would be my answer to that part of Keisha's question. Uh, the next thing I would say is just as, a, as an aside, I would never eat food or drink non-bottled drinks from flight service, nor would I eat any food heated in a microwave ever. As to whether or not residual radiation is present in the food when you eat it, um, microwave radiation does turn your food into something foreign and toxic to the body. It distorts the molecular integrity and depletes the nutrition integrity of the food that is radiated. So. I don't want the molecules of my food, well, more specifically, the water in that food spun. That's what radiation does. That's what microwave radiation does. It spins the molecules and completely changes that food or liquid into something other than food, in my opinion, again. I feel like in this episode, I'm saying in my opinion a lot. I'm going to stop saying that because it goes without saying that everything I'm saying in this whole show is based on my opinion. Kevin asks, I need to get an x-ray taken of my neck for views and wondering if I should be worried about the radiation. My insurance won't let me get an MRI without getting an x-ray first. Oh, brutal. Even though that is what I need. Is there anything I can do to protect myself from the radiation? Hmm, This is an interesting question. Uh, The first thing that popped out to me, Kevin, was Should I be worried about the radiation? No, you should not ever be worried about EMF or anything for that matter, if you can help it. I would do everything in your spiritual power to not worry. So uh, I'm going to get to more of how we do that. But uh, you might be able to, you know, here's the thing. I I actually don't think that work. I'm thinking, yeah, wear like EMF shielded clothing when you get this stuff done, but then it's going to block their image and they're going to pull you out of the machine going, dude, what the hell are you wearing? So I don't think there is anything you can really do about it, but I'm going to give you my answers as follows. Uh, I always avoid MRIs and x-rays wherever possible, but of course, sometimes it's hard to avoid them when you're dealing with structural issues and injuries and things like that in your body. Like you just, you got to have an MRI. It's the only way to figure out what's going on. I would definitely make sure to do a few days of detox using binders like activated charcoal, do some infrared saunas, uh, perhaps consider the Quicksilver Scientific black box detox uh, after exposure to heavy metals or high dose radiation, or specifically for MRIs, the contrast fluid that they inject into that stuff is not fun. It's basically just, uh, it's, it's basically just like high dosing deuterium. And for those of you that don't know what deuterium is, it's a heavy hydrogen which causes um, the nanomotors in your mitochondria to get gummed up, thus limiting your ability to produce ATP, which is where you get your energy. I did an episode uh, a couple years ago all about deuterium. Actually, I did three of them in a row. It was six hours about deuterium. I was the first guy, proudly to say, uh, to break deuterium really on the podcast scene. Um, and you will be full of deuterium after an MRI. And so um, there's not much you can do to get that out, but you definitely want to get that contrast out of your system and just get any of that residual funk out of your body. And so I think saunas would be great. By the way, if you do want to deplete your body of deuterium, there is called something called a deuterium depleted water. It's made by um, Deuterium Depletion Centers or ddcenters.com. It's not cheap, but it works. I've gone through about two different three-month series of drinking that water exclusively and brought my deuterium levels down considerably. It's quite fantastic. It's it's amazing really how it works. It's awesome, but uh, you're going you're gonna to spend a few hundred bucks to do it. 
Also remember, uh, my friend Kevin, to think positive thoughts when you're in that MRI, when you're getting the X, uh, getting the X-ray. You know, really energize loving, kind emotions. Don't forget the body creates its own magnetic field and it's done so through your intention, the thoughts you have and the energy behind your emotions. And this is really what Kundalini Yoga is all about, by the way, which, hey, do some Kundalini Yoga before you go get the x-ray and the MRI. Um, These practices, these ancient practices, including various types of breath work and different kriyas and singing mantras and prayer and setting intentions and affirmations and all of those amazing spiritual practices do, in fact, increase your body's magnetic field and your potential to defend yourself naturally. So don't worry. Don't be afraid. Go get your MRI. Get the x-ray. Don't trip, man. Just stay positive about it. Sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. You will survive. You will recover. You are an infinite spiritual being having a human experience for just a few minutes, really, like in this lifetime. So with all of this stuff, I'm going to keep going back to that. It's about awareness, not fear. There's a difference. You have to have discernment as to when you're just, you know, being proactive and making changes and when you are freaking yourself out. Our next question is from Giovanna. She says, hello, friends, looking to spread the knowledge to my loved ones about why they shouldn't use a microwave. Any useful scientific resources you can share that don't involve listening to a podcast? What What kind of people don't listen to podcasts, really? No, seriously, I get it. Uh, I have not personally done much scientific research into the microwave ovens thing, but there is a plethora of info available online. However, be mindful of the censorship and fact checkers, which will likely come from the corrupt organizations like the WHO, Google, etc. My personal aversion to microwave ovens is just based on common sense, like I talked about earlier. Is there a microwave oven in nature? Did God make one? No. Uh, Has it been proven to me unequivocally that they do not cause harm? If the answer is no, I'm out. I'm always going to go with nature or technologies which have proven themselves to be safe, like a good old gas burning stove. (laughs) Also remember the futility of trying to control others as much as we might love them. And this is where something like Al-Anon might come in handy. Joking, not joking. Uh, Codependency, wanting to control others is a form of neurosis. I've suffered from it. I've worked really hard to overcome it. I hold my tongue all the time around people that I love when they're doing things that I think are incredibly stupid. Folks generally want to be left alone. They want to make choices for themselves. I don't want to be told what to do. Like I don't want someone coming into my house going, dude, why do you do the red light therapy? That's stupid. Stop doing that. I'll be like, get out of my house. I like it. And I would say the same thing if I, well, you know, sometimes like I talk about in the show, I I like to just bust out to the gas station and grab a Snickers or some M&Ms, you know, like GMO beet sugar and artificial everything, you know, I just like to live a little. And if someone was breathing over my shoulder going, dude, I thought you're like this health guy and biohacker. Why are you eating that? I would find that really annoying. However, as I said, I understand it is very difficult when you love someone and you see them harming themselves to not try and intervene. As a parent, uh, you typically have more agency over decisions like this. As it's your job, I think, to protect your offspring. So I don't know whether or not Giovanna is talking about her kids or just people in her life in general. But uh, I would, you know, in a sane, non-controlling way, do my best to deter people from using things like microwaves. And um, if you do a quick Google search, you're going to find... you know, weird, like crazy fake news. Like I found tonight in researching uh, this topic for my manuscript, there was an article that said microwaving can be even better for keeping more nutrients in your food than baking or cooking in a pan. Hey, who knows? Like maybe, but it sounds like some seriously deep fake news to me. Uh, It's likely the censorship and misinformation propaganda being perpetuated by the corporate monsters who control big tech. And this is especially true if you're using Google. So if you want to research this, Giovanna, try doing your research with something like DuckDuckGo as a browser for less curated, quote, end quote, search results. In other words, search results that aren't controlled by big pharma interests, et cetera. And finally, our last question is from Aaron. He says, EMF building biologist question, how far from a high tension power line is safe? A mile, five miles, et cetera. 
As far as power lines go, Aaron, distance depends on the type of power line and the presence of transformers, etc. Now, my house here in LA is quite close to the power lines in front of the house, yet there is minimal magnetic field coming from those lines. I've tested them. However, some very tall, high-tension power lines might emit insane levels of magnetic fields directly below them, in fact, hundreds of feet away. So again, without testing, this is all guesswork. However, it is much easier to test for magnetic fields using small, inexpensive meters like the ones I mentioned earlier from my site or from Amazon than it is testing cell towers or something like that that produces RF due to the complexity of the signal. Testing RF is really tricky because there's so many different frequencies and you need really sophisticated meters not only to determine the signal strength, but the type of signal and the direction of where the signal is coming from. So I'd recommend to you, Aaron, really like get yourself a, uh, you know, like it's called the tri-field meter. And that one is not great for RF. It's okay for electric fields, but the magnetic field testing on the tri-field meter, which is I think a couple hundred dollars is quite accurate. And it's really, really stupid, easy to use. So I would just go outside or be in your house, point that baby up at the power lines and see what you get. And if it's a high magnetic field, move. Also, um, he says, how far from a 5G city is still safe, quote, end quote. You know, like there is no safe in our world today. By the way, let's just clear that because even if you live in the middle of nowhere, there's probably radar and, you know, Elon Musk's freaking 5G satellites blasting down on you. So it's all kind of a farce at this point. But he asked that question because uh, he he thinks Jack Cruz might have mentioned it on this podcast. Like you need to live such and such miles away. And he he may have, in fact, I don't remember, honestly. Uh, but I will say again that this would require accurate testing as not all cell towers are created equal. They vary drastically in power output and in the various frequencies they emit. Now, all the frequencies are harmful, but the 4G and 5G frequency ranges are the most troubling. And many people don't realize that the existing 4G network is worse than some of the new 5G networks. For example, T-Mobile 4G LTE uses frequencies as follows. Band 2 is 1900 megahertz or uh, 19 gigahertz. Band 5 is 850 megahertz or 8.5 gigahertz. And band 4 is 1700 to 21 megahertz or 17 to 21 gigahertz. And that's really high radiation, depending on how close you are to it. These frequencies in the 10 to 20 gigahertz range are as troubling as the first phase of some 5G services, which use the same or sometimes even lower frequencies. The 5G issue itself is really confusing. And trust me, I don't have my head around it all the way. It's, it's very complex and you have to really stay on it to understand what's going on because of all the misinformation and everyone's different opinions about it. But many people are unaware that there are two phases to the 5G rollout. Although 3G, 4G, and 5G are damaging to all biological life forms, the scarier 5G that people are worried about is the short-range, high-power, millimeter wave, the same frequency used by military radar and crowd disbursement weapons. This is gnarly stuff. That's the millimeter waves. That's the big spook about 5G that everyone's freaked out about, and frankly, they should be. Within reason, of course, because remember, we don't freak out. We just educate ourselves and take logical, practical steps to protect ourselves and our family. This 5G infrastructure level is the most disconcerting as it requires more cell sites and they need to be closer to buildings due to their inability to penetrate solid objects easily. So they have to be close to buildings. I'm talking about the new small cell 5G millimeter wave dealios. Uh, They need to be very high powered to make it through buildings and they have to be close So if you were in a city that was, you know, the new 5G smart city that we're so concerned about, um, you wouldn't have to be very far away because they don't go very far. But the first generation, or I guess I should say phase one of 5G and even 4G and 3G, some of them are very high power and long distance. So you need to be further away. Again, this goes back to testing is everything. Without testing, we're all just completely speculating here. So the smartest thing to do is to live and work somewhere that does not yet have 5G or has banned its installation. Now, there are cities and communities around the world that have 
fought legally to prevent the rollout of 5G, even phase one, which again is just pretty much the same as 4G. It's not that much different in terms of the frequencies. Uh, There's just more of it now and have banned the future installation of the millimeter wave 5G, which is the phase two 5G. I know this is kind of confusing guys and just trying to stick with me. It's confusing to me too. Um, as I said, just getting my head around it and really wanted to provide accurate information here. Now, lower population uh, density areas are definitely best. So a town of say 10,000 people will have exponentially lower RF levels than a city of 50,000 and so on. To add another level of complexity, some towers are short range using lower power transmission while others are long range using lower power. So safe distance is tough to measure really without meters. If you think about what life was like 200 years ago, right? There was zero non-native EMF in the environment. So this is why I believe living in remote areas is absolutely best. And in almost all cases where any cell service is present, it's best to test and shield your home or at least your bedroom and your kid's room. As I've talked a lot about on the show, I'm looking to live somewhere where there is no cell service at all. And I know some people are going to go, wait, what? Oh, I need my phone. Well, there are ways to make your phone work in your house. It's called having a really badass, robust Ethernet cable system in your home. And anytime you want to use your phone, you plug it into the Ethernet. Now, I know that sounds like a pain in the ass to some people, but if you really want to go next level with the EMF, that's the way to do it. You block all signal coming into your house, you hardwire the whole house. And then you go old school. I remember being a little kid and if you wanted to use the phone, it was hooked to the wall and it had a dial on it. It took you like 10 minutes just to dial a goddamn number and you had to stand there or sit there with the corded little squiggly cord phone and make your call. And it was fine. We didn't mind at all. It was awesome to have a phone. So in some cases, like, you know, we want to take advantage of this technology, but taking a few steps back isn't going to kill you. I honestly dream every day about having a home that has no Wi Fi, no Bluetooth, no signals coming from outside, just a completely uh, ancestral, natural, paleolithic, energetic environment. And, you know, with some time, energy, and money, anyone can do that. Now, doing that in the middle of a city is going to be much, much harder. Living in the country is going to make that a lot less work. Uh, many people are unable or unwilling to live, you know, remotely like that, which I totally understand. I mean, I've lived in LA for 30 years. I've loved almost all of it. There's so much to offer in towns and cities in terms of employment opportunities, uh, meeting the love of your life, et cetera, where there's more people, there's just more fun, more stuff going on. Uh, but uh, kind of depends on where you are in your life. You know, I'm turning 50 years old. I'm looking at real estate in freaking, you know, Montana, Wyoming, um, Arizona, Idaho, Oregon. I'm like, where's there rivers, lakes, and no cell towers? That's where I want to move. That's just me. If you want to live in a, you know, mid to um, large city, then you got to pay more attention. If, if you care about this issue, that is, which at the end of this episode, I'm assuming you do. Um, You can follow some of the advice that I've given in this here solo episode. I want to thank everyone in the Facebook group. And again, if you're not in that group, it's called the Lifestylist Podcast Facebook group. It's an amazing community of really cool people in there, just people that are spiritually minded, people that really care about their health and well-being, people that are socially uh, very aware and active and awake. It's so refreshing. You know, I'm not really a Facebook user as a consumer. It's just kind of a business thing. I, don't, I can't remember the last time I looked on my Facebook page. Um, just never been particularly a fan of that platform uh, just because it's so distracting and there's just so much drama on there. Um, not to mention the <laughs> totalitarian uh, censorship efforts of Facebook. I mean, I really do believe it's part of the demonic forces controlling the world. (laughs) And I don't really want to support it, but for the time being, um, I'm using it to reach people and hopefully affect positive change in the world. So that's my spiel on Facebook. But if you join the group, there's some really cool people. There's sort of a a niche or an enclave of, um, what's that word? Enclave? Enclave? A a little, um, you know, a pod, let's say, a community of really cool people. So join that group. And thank you so much to the people in there for your participation and just general coolness. I wish we could all move to an EMF-free commune somewhere in the woods and collect spring water and just live our best life. Maybe someday we'll figure out a way to do it. 
Also, if you enjoyed this episode and you want to get down with five more hours of information just like this in the form of video all about EMF, make sure to register for the EMF Home Safety Masterclass. I'm really proud of this thing, man. I put months and months of effort and work into this. It's an immense amount of valuable information that goes into much more detail than I had time to cover here today and has done so in a really fun, entertaining way. This is not like a science geek bore fest. It's really fun and very cool. Great editing. There's a little rock and roll music. I mean, it's unlike any um, online class you've ever seen. And it is, in fact, the only online class that teaches you about EMF in uh, the world. So I was kind of the first one at the table here because it's the most important thing uh, in terms of our health and also for the environment. So again, go to lukestory.com slash EMF masterclass to enroll. You get all seven modules, six bonus videos, three PDFs for only $149. And the content's all on demand. So you can watch it whenever you want. You get lifetime access. It's not like a course you have to follow along with every week. So people that are busy with work and life, you can just watch it instead of Netflix for a few weekends and uh, you'll make your way through it. Let's thank our official sponsors. First one being again, surthrival.com slash Luke Story. That is surthrival.com slash Luke Story, spelled S U R T H R I V A L, like survive and thrive. Surthrival.com slash Luke Story is where you will find um, many products that are sitting in my kitchen right now as I speak. The taboo product I mentioned earlier is insane. I mean, honestly. <laughs> I don't really believe in aphrodisiacs and stuff. I think that shit is corny. I'm going to be honest, but I've tried this product a few times and I don't know. I don't want to get too personal here, but it works legit. It's amazing. And I've been using their pine pollen for years, which is amazing for boosting your testosterone. And that in itself is really an aphrodisiac. So these guys took this to the next level. So if you take both of those products, you're going to be a serious horn dog. So, you know, make sure you have someone on hand that can stand to see you naked because it's going to happen. I also love their uh, colostrum product. I put a huge overdose scoop of that in my morning elixir every single day. It's amazing. And they've, of course, got, you know, all kinds of other products there. A great uh, hemp product or no? Well, yeah, it's a hemp product, a CBD product. Comes in a little spray bottle. And guess who gets that? My dog, Cookie. CBD is really good for dogs because it uh, supports their anti-inflammatory situation. And dogs tend to get a lot of inflammation, especially if they've been fed grains and a bunch of swag food uh, throughout their life. Mine has not, at least not in the four years since I adopted her, but um, that CBD is really good stuff. And it's also great for calming your pets down, by the way. Uh, I've flown with my dog a couple of times and I give her a mega dose of CBD and she is out like out like a light, dark, gone. <laughs> and so that's really helpful in a situation in which you need your pet to get their chill on. Our next sponsor is Just Thrive Health. These guys make the most innovative probiotic on the market. It's spore-based, meaning your digestive tract doesn't fry it on the way down. It goes inside you and hatches and makes friendly bacteria that will solve your gut dysbiosis issues. It's incredible. It's called justthrivehealth.com. The code there is Luke15, and that saves you 15% off at justthrivehealth.com. Last but most certainly not least, and I uh, talked a bit about blue light in this episode, in fact, is our sponsor, Blue Blocks. You can find them at B-L-U-B-L-O-X, blueblocks.com. They make some stylish, durable, very well-made, very scientifically valid blue blocking glasses at blueblocks.com and the code there is lifestylus which saves you 15% off. All right, we made it you guys. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode. I will be back next Tuesday with Shot in the Dark blowing the whistle on the vaccine industry and COVID with Robert F Kennedy Jr., one of the best and most impactful interviews I have ever done out of 300. You don't want to miss that one. Trust me, you are going to trip. That's uh, some seriously potent information that uh, Robert F. Kennedy shared with us. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss any upcoming episodes. Also, if you subscribe and you've been subscribed for a while, just know that uh, iTunes will unsubscribe you if you haven't listened in a while. So if you just pop back into the show today because you're like, hey, a solo show from Luke. I wonder what he's up to. I want to learn about EMFs. You got to resubscribe. Uh, this way, the new episodes will be automatically downloaded to your device or computer. 
And that's not only important for you so that you don't miss anything, it's important for me because that helps my download numbers. Every time an episode is downloaded to your phone and you click play, that counts as a download. And in the world of podcasting, you are judged by your downloads and your downloads only. That means everything. Well, downloads and reviews. I don't really bug you guys for reviews because I don't know why I should. Actually, if you like this show, do your old pal Luke a favor and leave me a review. But more than anything, I just want to thank you for joining me. It gives me great pleasure and a sense of purpose to share information like this that can transform your life if you take it little by little and just start applying what you learn. You know, listening to it and learning is head knowledge, but it becomes wisdom when you apply it. So thanks for joining me on this episode of the Lifestylist Podcast. Podcast.